My name is Mark Nonneman. My uh, consulting firm is SMN Consulting, and I'm um, centered in uh, San Antonio, so a little bit, not too far from y'all. Uh, and I do say y'all, so that, that helps, I suppose. And uh, you can see I got a bunch of letters after my name, uh, it, just like Ravi. I'm also a professional scrum trainer. Um, I also teach Kanban and other things, SAFE, et cetera. As part of my uh, work with the scrum.org uh, organization, I also am one of two stewards, I'll explain what steward is in a second, for evidence-based management. And um, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, the original title of the talk was Evidence-Based Agility. And uh, that's really where we're gonna be headed in this particular group. But the framework that I'm gonna be describing happens to be called Evidence-Based Management. So I shifted the title slightly. Sorry about that, Robbie. Um, and we're gonna talk in particular about using evidence-based management for achieving audacious or really ambitious goals. Now, I, went, I mentioned this word steward. The way scrum.org works, uh, is that members of the training community, uh, people like Ravi and I, actually uh, some of us are selected to take ownership of courseware and we develop and maintain and improve that courseware over time. Uh, Ravi's a steward as well. Ravi and I have worked with EVM for quite a long time and um, a lot of times the way it comes up is that uh, my clients will want to know what they need to measure. It usually starts out that way. Perhaps they're adopting Scrum or some other agile practice. And uh, early on, they might want to be measuring something like velocity. And uh, typically, we'll have to have a conversation about what velocity is for and what, what it's good for and what it's not good for. And um, if they, and we try to convince them, you know, look, velocity is good for one thing in Scrum to do forecasting, but it doesn't tell you the performance of a team. It doesn't let you compare one team to another. It doesn't tell you whether you're delivering value. It's not for that. And they say, well, okay, I'll, I'll buy that but what should I be measuring? And usually uh, we like to start off with talking about what you currently measure. So I'm gonna ask you to follow me over to the next section here and I'm gonna summon you over to this space. And you'll notice that uh, we've got these labels around current measures along the top, inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, and organizational results. I'm gonna explain what those are in just a second. And then beneath them, we have some sticky notes that uh, show us some examples. I just give you one example of each type of metric. And uh, what I'm gonna ask you to do in just a minute is to contribute to this list, but let's take a look at these measures and explain what they are. So inputs are the things that we need in order to do anything in our work. And you can see budget is an example of inputs. And there might be different ways to measure budget, right? It could be the amount of budget we've spent. It could be the amount of uh, budget that remains. But very often we'll have metrics around budget. Now, once we have the inputs, that, that would include probably other things as well besides just money. We have to have people and other things. Those would be other forms of inputs potentially. We'll probably have activities. That is to say the things that we're doing day to day, our, our work, tasks that we perform. And if you're using Scrum, for example, I'm sure a lot of you know about Scrum, uh, we might, some of the activities could be planning a sprint, uh, it could be coding or testing or integrating uh, or any of those things. And if you're uh, maybe concerned with delivery, a lot of DevOps activities would be in this category as well, around the, the testing, the integrating, even deployment uh, could be an activity. Then there's outputs. These are things that actually get delivered from the company. And I gave you an example of a release here. And uh, uh, we might simply, in terms of measuring release, it might be the number of releases. It could be releases over periods of time, that kind of thing. That would be a one form of output. Oh, I forgot to mention my example on activities. You just noticed I put test coverage there. So test cover testing is a task and the metric around it might be how good is our tests, test coverage. And of course, you probably know there are many forms of test coverage. All right, well, once we have outputs, that is, we've put something out there into the world for our users and our customers, we have that opportunity for outcomes. So these are things that cause uh, the customer, that affect the users or our customers of our products. Um, maybe it allows them to do something that they couldn't do before or uh, ask them to behave in a certain way. And an outcome might be in this example that we measure click-throughs. Maybe we've got a call to action out on a website and we're asking customers to respond to us. Well, if they've clicked on it, then that's a form or a measurement 
of outcomes, the way we've affected customers. And then finally, organizational results. These are the long-term impacts to the organization itself that uh, has the inputs to create the activities to produce the outputs. And um, I gave an example of organizational results like sales. Usually there's quite a bit of lag between what customers want to do and uh, sales. And there are other kinds of organizational results we, we might see. So this is just a simple model we use to think about different kinds of metrics in an organization. So I'm going to ask you to contribute. And let's see, how many people do we have? We must have about 23, it looks like, 22, 23 people. Um, so I'm going to ask you to uh, add sticky notes to this of things that your organization currently measures and whatever you can think of that your organization actually measures now. And uh, go ahead and add sticky notes into there. Put them in the category you think they go in as best you can. Uh, doesn't have to be too precise. So I'm gonna put a little timer up here for just three minutes and uh, see what kind of uh, responses that we can get. So you'll see the timer there in the mural itself. Cool, all right, very good. Uh, so this is interesting. Now, um, a lot of these uh, are pretty, uh, pretty typical ones, although some of them is a little more advanced, number of experiments, for example, um, don't often see that. Now, things like testing is actually uh, gonna be something around activities, actually. Even if you're testing with customers, but it's not in production, then that's not something that's been output yet, if you will. Likewise with, um, the demo review could be an outcome if it's a demo with customers, but typically that's going to be something more around the activity list. Um, and, uh, and it would be normal to see lots of metrics, kind of what we see here, lots of metrics around activities and outputs. Usually, depending on where on the business, you'll see several organizational results measures, especially if you're a public company, you've got to report certain typical ones like sales and profit and uh, whatever it is that might be relevant to your organization. Okay, but very often the outcomes and what we have here are OKRs uh, are the primary ones for outcomes. Um, <clears throat> and I, we, we don't have the microphones on, so I'm gonna, in terms of done, um, typically that might be something more like outputs if it's done work or it might only be activities depending on the definition of done. Now that might not be what was meant when you put that uh, flow up there, or uh, excuse me, that sticky up there. So I apologize if that's different. Flow does affect customers. So uh, if we're able to measure that in some way, that would be pretty good. But, but of course, outcomes are where the real difference in the world uh, comes from. So uh, we may not, um, and we often don't have a lot of metrics there, which is really pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, but it's easier to measure activities because we control it, we're doing it, that kind of thing. All right, so we get a sense of where our measures are. Maybe we get a little bit of sense of maybe we're missing some measures. Perhaps we should be focusing a little more on the actual effect we're having on users and customers. Now, I told you this often comes up when a client asks me, what should I measure? That's the title of this page right here. And whenever a client asks me that, we might have a discussion on what they're currently measuring. My next question to them is always, every time, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, because very often a lot of these measures, whether it's whip age or velocity variance or cycle time or any of those things, you know, the question, why are you measuring those? What's the purpose? What are you trying to achieve? And that's a really important measure because uh, we really need to focus on trying to use measures to help us make advancement toward our particular objectives, toward our goals. So, um, that's the, the thing that I want to focus on here is this idea that uh, the goal needs to be the focus that we're all using in order to do everything that we're doing. And of course, with apologies to Lewis Carroll, if you don't know where you're going, any measure will get you there. I, a little bit of a paraphrase there. Uh, of course, he said any road will take you there. And um, we, we could just measure anything. If we don't know what our goals are, we don't know what we're trying to achieve, then the goals are not only useless, and potentially wasteful, they could also be dangerous. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Now, when we're talking about goals from an evidence-based management perspective, there are all kinds of goals, right? I might have a goal today to talk to three new contacts uh, in my client funnel. Um, that's fine, that's a goal, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but that's really not exactly the goal that we're talking about when we 
when we need evidence to uh, gauge our progress toward these goals. So we often talk about um, big, ambitious, or audacious goals. And this is a very famous goal I'm sure you're all familiar with. Let me summon you to this slide so we're in the same space. Um, you're probably familiar with John F. Kennedy's <clears throat> quote about uh, going to the moon and back again safely. And um, that was certainly very specific. We knew exactly where we needed to get to. Uh, it was measurable. In this case, it's almost true false, but there was also the element of safety. Uh, it was certainly ambitious or even audacious because at this point in time, if you're familiar, this was in 1961, most of our attempted rocket launches were exploding on the launch pad. So th the thought of putting a human being in one of these things was frightening. And we had really unsure that it could be done. There was really, uh, obviously had never been done before. And, and so this is certainly a very ambitious goal and it was time bound, wanted to do it by the end of the 1960s. And as you know, of course, we were successful in doing that with um, a lot of failure along the way, even death, as you might know in Apollo 1, three astronauts were killed in a fire on the launch pad. Um, <clears throat> now, when goals are really ambitious like this, uh, to try to achieve them, to do all the work necessary, where we're going to have to try things out, it's never been done before. Uh, we like to use a word, a, a particular technique called empiricism. You're probably familiar with that phrase. If you studied Scrum or Agile practices at all, you know that they're all based on empiricism. And uh, because these goals are so audacious and uh, we need to work toward them, we're going to need to use empiricism in order to to check our progress toward those goals. So uh, this is part of the thing that we wanna be thoughtful about. All right, now, <clears throat> so if we started to talk about our goals and we started to form them in a good way, and there's lots of different formats you could use. Uh, in the previous exercise, uh, several people mentioned OKRs. That's objectives and key results, if you're not familiar with that, a technique Andy Grove developed at Intel many years ago, and it's used by companies like Google and, and a lot of other companies in the world today. Uh, that's a perfectly great uh, technique that you could use to get clarity around your goals. Um, you might be familiar with the four disciplines of execution. That's one of my favorites. That has a, a technique of developing effective goals. Maybe you're just using the SMART acronym. You're probably familiar with SMART goals, specific, measurable, I, I make A ambitious or audacious, um, realizable, uh, so shouldn't violate the laws of physics as we know it and or some things like that and it should be time bound. Some discussion in our evidence-based management team is whether really good goals need to be time bound but I'm going to uh, state this position that if a goal isn't time bound then it's really just then it's a vision or a mission or a strategy or something like that and that's perfectly good. You need missions and visions and strategy um, and goals are things we use in order to begin movement toward achieving that mission or vision. And goals need to be time bound. So I'm going to just posit that and, uh, and we'll go with that. Now, once we have some goals, we can think about measures in a little bit of a, a different way. So we've got these audacious goals. And as part of evidence-based management, we've developed a particular model for measures that we call key value areas. <clears throat> So these are listed here on this particular slide. Let me get everybody on the same page. And you can see there's current value. I'll give you a really brief uh, definition of them. We're gonna use this in just a moment. Uh, current value, that's what the, the organization is currently delivering into the marketplace. And you could think of it as things like um, the current amount of sales. It's what customers um, currently think about you and your goodwill with them. It could be the uh, goodwill in the community would be another thing that would be part of the current value. Uh, what are those products and services uh, in the marketplace? Um, another key value area is time to market. That is to say, how long does it take us as an organization to deliver new value? And uh, that would be from including how much ideation, the time, once we have a good idea, uh, how long does it take us to get that out into the customer's hands so that they can actually get benefit from it, if they get benefit. Whether they do or not would be part of the current value once it's out there and it's valuable, or maybe it's not valuable. Maybe it's even taking away value. It could be negative value, but whether it's, uh, you know, whatever that value is, how long does it take us to get from an idea that's valuable to delivering it in the marketplace all the way to the customer's hands? Uh, then there's the ability to innovate. 
That is to say, how effective are we at delivering new value? And that's in contrast to maintaining the current value, to uh, keeping our customers happy. That's not unimportant, but if we can't deliver new things, then we'll always be behind our competition. So uh, the ability to get new valuable things into the marketplace is important. How long it takes us time to market, our ability to do that um, in terms of number of items, the value of those items uh, compared to the way we spend other forms of, of resources is what we're looking at there. Now, all three of those are current state areas. That is to say, obviously current value is what we currently deliver. Time to market is our current ability to, in terms of time it takes to deliver. And the ability to innovate is our current ability. It's not what we'd like it to be or what it used to be. It's what it is right now. Uh, and the fourth area is pretty interesting because uh, the fourth area is something, uh, an area that was added relatively recently, several years ago, that we label unrealized value. And unrealized value is where all our opportunity is. Very often that's where our big audacious goals are. What are the new things that we could deliver? Now an audacious goal could be to increase our ability to innovate, could be to reduce our time to market, and, um, all, and all of those things are cool because they can help us achieve some of that unrealized value. So whatever the value is we're currently delivering, uh, it's likely there's some amount of value we could be delivering that we're not. And that's the unrealized value measures. So, uh, you know, again, a pretty simple measure uh, metric model. Uh, it's different than the other metric model we used uh, just a few moments ago. But let's see if we could put them together. And to do that, I'm going to ask you, I need to do a, just a little bit of a setup here. I'm going to take uh, these measures that we came up with a few minutes ago, and I'm going to bring a copy of them. It takes a moment, there we go, right down here. And it, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'd like you to try to cate categorize these measures, the ones that we already came up with, as either current value, time to market, ability to innovate, or unrealized value. All you're going to do is measure these, I'm sorry, move these sticky notes from where they are over here in the copy to uh, this quadrant, one of these four quadrants. So again, I'll give us a couple minutes and see, see what we come up with in terms of our key value areas. Some of them may seem to be more than one. You can put them on a line if you All right, want. Very good. Yeah, it looks like you did a, a pretty good job here. Notice that um, um, OKRs uh, is very good. Notice that those were in the, if you remember, those were in the outcome uh, category of unrealized value because they're objectives and key results. And as I mentioned, that's a great format to use. Um, milestones, presumably that's for things that we're trying to deliver that are new. Um, the planning uh, is, it depends on what we're planning. Uh, very often if we're doing strategic planning, that could well be something around unrealized value. Uh, and testing typically is gonna be somewhere around uh, the time to market and ability to innovate, uh, almost certainly. Um, <clears throat> so as is often the case, there's uh, things like um, sales, of course, business value is pretty obvious, budget, click-throughs, those are pretty good. Um, some of the measures like velocity are very difficult to think about, but if you think about velocity as a measure of activity, and it's uh, the rate at which we're able to get things done, and so velocity is actually gonna be probably a little more related, or most likely to time to market. And um, very good, uh, pretty good. Interesting, in, uh, the ability to innovate, coverage, velocity variance possibly maybe, mm -hmm. number of experiments, yeah, that, I think that's true. Um, those are good measures. All right, and you'll notice that uh, some of our measures tended to be a little bit right-handed heavy in this, this particular diagram. And uh, what that might give us a clue if this were our organization, we might say, gee, I wonder if there's some areas we're not focusing in, in terms of things like ability to innovate. Maybe there's something there that we haven't been thoughtful about. So again, these models are, are helpful uh, uh, to help us think about measures we do have, where we might have some gaps, and then also to think about what we might wanna do, with, uh, do about those gaps. Maybe we need some different measures. Now, typically I don't like to advise people to add new measures. Maybe we need to take some away. Uh, maybe some of these measures that we currently have aren't really particularly useful. Um, I'm about halfway through, so I think I'm gonna pause for a moment and see, I think we do have a question 
or two. Janie, do we have anything? Yes, we, yes, we had from your, fir from your first exercise. Um, can you please explain how these columns are related from input to output in that relationship? Ah, very good. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to ask you to, that's a great question that I am going to address in just a, just a few moments. So hold that question. We're going to talk exactly about that. Okay. Do we have you, any other questions? I don't see anything else right okay. now. If anybody has anything, type it in here real quick. <clears throat> we'll keep going. If you do have questions, go ahead and type them in as you think of them, and that way you won't forget. And um, that way, Janie will have a view of that. So let's, uh, let's keep going here. Now, um, these are existing measures. Now, remember, we said that the goals had to come first, and then we would use measures to tell us about our progress toward the goal. And uh, one of the interesting problems about uh, goals and the measures of goals is that the measures are what we call lagging indicators. Uh, so to answer the question, what's the relationship of those items? Here we go. This is exactly the way we use that model. And um, the way we, we used it at first, it just kind of looked like a one dimensional list of measures. Let me pull everybody into the same space here in the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in the mural. Um, and this idea of leading and lagging is really important. So remember, our, our, if our big audacious goal is to get to the moon and back by the end of the decade, well, we could measure a true or false measure of getting to the moon and back. And uh, the problem is by the end of the decade, if we didn't make it, well, what do we do about it? It's too late now, right? So um, whether your, uh, your um, big audacious goal is customer outcome oriented or organizational uh, results oriented, um, in either of those cases, we would like to know whether we're likely to achieve the goal. Are we seeing changes in behavior? Because remember, these are audacious. That means it's something new, it's something we haven't done before. And that means we're going to have to change the behavior of the organization, perhaps the behavior of our customers and users, in order to achieve this goal. So could we measure, could we find some metrics that would tell us the possibility that we're likely to achieve the goal? Something that would be again, a leading indicator, something that's influenceable, that if things aren't going well by that leading indicator, we could take action. We could do something different than we're doing now in order to try to uh, assure progress toward the goal. So we need both. We got to measure whether we're achieving the goal or not. That's really important because that's the goal itself. But we, always, we also need to find these leading indicators. Now, here's the thing. Lagging indicators, very often the goal tells you what the lagging indicator is right in the goal itself. In fact, using OKRs or the 4DX goal approach, the, the metric is in the goal. Uh, so the lagging indicator is usually pretty easy to uh, identify, very difficult to influence. And uh, given that it's a time bound goal, we don't want to wait to the end to find out. We need to get the leading indicators. Now, here's the problem with leading indicators. They can be very difficult to identify. And uh, furthermore, they can be very difficult to measure because they're often behavior oriented. Uh, and measuring people's behavior can be quite tricky. Uh, in fact, it can be even diff not only difficult to find a metric for it, it can have unintended consequences that we may not want. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So part of the trick, if you will, of achieving these audacious goals is finding the leading indicators that will tell us whether we're likely to make progress to the goal. And they're very difficult to find. However, they are influenceable. So we can make change with those leading indicators by doing different things, trying different approaches. Now I mentioned the leading indicators are typically about behavior and that leads to another uh, effect that we wanna be very aware of and that is what's known as the observer effect. Now the observer effect, let me get everybody on this page again. Uh, the observer effect is, is stated here in the, the blue text. Individuals may modify an aspect of their behavior in response to the awareness of being observed. That is to say measured. And you've probably uh, seen this before. You may be quite familiar with it. Uh, in the scrum world, it's really common. If I measure velocity of a team and uh, that measurement is used by anyone other than the team, you're likely to see changes in the velocity. Even if, even if no manager is using velocity, the people on the team are gonna think that they are, and they're gonna make up their own story. Well, they must wanna see velocity go up. So 
let's finish more items. Let's just find a way or let's increase our estimate of the effort so we get more points or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. That's not, if, that's not behavior that we want. That's uh, a side effect of, be, of people being observed that we need to be conscious and aware of. And um, the people doing those changes, the behavior that they're changing in response to being measured, they may not even be aware of it. So it's not like ne they're necessarily trying to fool us or even themselves. Um, we, and we know that this is part of human behavior that when we're measured and we know we're being measured, it'll affect us. So one, te one technique we might think about uh, in dealing with the observer effect is to balance our measures. Lots of people like to use quantitative measures. Uh, they're, you know, they're easier. That's what velocity is, right? How many product backlog items do we finish this sprint? That's a count. Um, and if I think the velocity should go up, well, let's finish more of them. Well, how are we gonna finish more of them? Well, let's, you know, we don't really need to do regression testing during the sprint. We'll just do that later. That's not a desired behavior, right? Uh, it will affect velocity and not in a good way, even though velocity goes up. So if you're gonna have a quantitative measure, you might wanna balance it with a qualitative measure. And I've got a couple examples down here on this bottom table. Uh, you can see them there. If, if, I, if I have a goal to reduce the lead time to deliver new features, or you might call it cycle time, uh, one possible unintended consequence could be that I get it out there faster, but it's not as good a quality. Maybe there are more problems. Maybe it's not quite ready for the customer to be using. And maybe I could balance out that risk with um, also measuring the qualitative effect. I'd like to make sure that our production found defects are decreasing or at least do not go up perhaps. Now the way these measures are listed, by the way, just as a quick comment, <clears throat> Uh, is that uh, they're really uh, goal oriented. You notice it has the direction I want, reduce, right? That's, a, that's an objective. The measure here on the left would be lead time to deliver new features. The measure on the right would be production found defects. Uh, it is also true that we typically want to see a trend or a, or a direction. Sometimes we wanna achieve a number, but trends are often more interesting. Um, and so uh, indicating the direction that we would like to see uh, can be useful. But remember, the metric itself is only part of that statement. Uh, increasing sales. Uh, I worked for a company several years ago where uh, they gave the sales force only a goal of sales. And by the end of the year, they'd of course exceeded that goal. The problem is they'd sold a whole bunch of low margin stuff. And so the problem is that our profitability actually went down. That wasn't good and that wasn't what was intended. Uh, again, observer effect, unintended consequences. And uh, so perhaps we need a balancing measure that we want some percentage of those sales to be of a particular product type. For example, I, I listed maintenance contracts. If, if those are, for example, high margin and we'd like to make sure we have a lot of those. And I won't go through the third one, you get the idea. So uh, often we, if, if we're gonna think about uh, these measures, we may wanna have balancing measures to make sure that we I try to account for unintended side effects. Okay, uh, let's put some of these things together. And again, this is gonna be an activity for you. So I'm gonna gather us around here. <clears throat> this idea of uh, the leading and lagging indicators, and we can think about inputs leading to outputs, outputs, I'm sorry, inputs leading to activities, excuse me. In fact, you know, I never really went through that. So let me back up here for a second. Have you come uh, join me here for a moment? Um, yeah, the inputs, uh, in order to answer the question that was asked, lead to activities and the things that we're going to do. Those activities lead to outputs. Eventually we need to get something out into the customer's hand. Whatever we get into the customer's hands have some kind of effect on the customer and outcome. Now the word effect is interesting because it could be good, it could be bad. Uh, so we have to be very careful about what it is. And those outcomes eventually produce organizational results. If we can get customers to really appreciate what we're doing more and more, they may be more of our existing product, maybe they refer their friends and colleagues to our company, our product or our service, so that we can gain market share. And those are things that would be measures of organizational results. Obviously we have to get those results in order to have the inputs. So if I'm a for-profit company, I need to be generating profit in order to be able to use that money, or at least gross profit, in order to use that money for future development and delivery. Otherwise, things are gonna dry up and we're not gonna be doing any activities to produce outputs to please our customers so that they buy more from us. Okay, so I apologize for that uh, 
thing. Let's try putting it together. Again, we'll come back to this uh, slide here. What I'm going to ask you to do, sort of a bit of a brainstorming session. Let's imagine that our goal was to achieve the highest rated user experience in our product category, whatever you think that product category might be. Let's say it's, I don't know, I'm looking at a web browser right now. Let's say we have a fancy new web browser, because yes, we need another one of those. And um, we would like to be the best in the industry for user experience. How would we measure that? Well, in our industry of web browsers, CNET is one of the most popular review uh, companies. Uh, they're well respected for their reviews. They're unbiased. You can't buy a review. And uh, maybe that's what we decide. Let's imagine that we decide that. So I'm not asking whether this is a good, vol good goal or a good lagging indicator of that goal. Let's just accept it for our purposes. What I'm looking for are ideas around leading indicators. Again, you can think about here's our outcome that we want. We want uh, high lead, the highest rated user experience. What kind of activities and outputs might we produce in order to try to get to that rating? and try to think about those measures. Some of you are already at it, that's great. The rest of you, if you can um, think about that, let's give us a couple minutes. I think I'll give us three, see what kind of great ideas you come up with. That might be leading indicators to user experience rating by CNET. Okay, very good, that's, that's time here. Um, good, there's, there's several things that we could use. Uh, and you've come up with a lot of good ideas. And this is kind of typically how it works. We would brainstorm a lot of things. We don't want to measure all these. Right? It's too, many, too much data to collect. We want to try to find the ones that we think would be the best leading indicators. And I try to start with only two or at most three. Um, that's an, actually an important point I think uh, is worth bringing up. When we talk about these big audacious goals that we're trying to achieve, and I'll talk about how we're gonna work to achieve them just next. Um, how, many should we, how many of these goals should we have? Well, you know, realistically, uh, an organization can really only work toward one or two big audacious goals. We're really not gonna be able to have 10 ambitious, audacious changes in the world that we're gonna be able to achieve. And um, the same thing goes with metrics. So for those one or two big goals, we don't wanna have 25 metrics. We wanna have a very small number of metrics because we need to be able to look at these measures and kind of almost at a glance determine whether we're making progress or not. Now, in um, EBM implementations, we use a dashboard. I'm not gonna talk about a dashboard today. We just didn't have enough time to include that. But uh, the kind of dashboard that I'd like to have would be the same kind of dashboards we see when we go to a football game, right? That's a different kind of a dashboard than the head coach might have. Right? The head coach might have a spreadsheet filled with hundreds of columns and rows for every player. And he's got all kinds of statistics and all of that. And that may be very useful for the coach, but that doesn't help the fans and the players know where they stand in the game right now. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna have that kind of player scoreboard that gives us just a few key measures to tell us we're making progress or not. And we'll take a look at how we're gonna use that in just a minute. So uh, we might generate lots of them. We need to whittle it down to a few. And a lot of these are what we would call measures. That is to say, it's, a, it's a, uh, an idea of the data that we need to collect and we'll have to turn that into a metric. And those two words are important. A measure is a little bit conceptual. A metric has been standardized. There's a specific way to collect the data consistently so that we can look at it um, uh, over time, for example not always over time, but very often, and be able to compare uh, one situation with another situation. And so we standardize the measure into a metric. So if you're confused about those words, that's what they mean for us, at least for us in the evidence-based management space. Okay, let's move a little, a little bit into the management part. So far, we've just been talking about the evidence part of evidence-based management. So the first question was, what should I measure? And uh, the only way to get to that answer is to ask another question, what is your goal? What are you trying to achieve? So we've been talking about that. But now that you've got some measures, what do you do with them? That's the next question. That's the management part of EBM. And uh, we have a little diagram here that we euphemistically call the magic wand diagram. <laughs> you can see why. And um, this is the uh, framework for what we do with the measures. First of all, you can see the goal there, that big star. That, that, that uh, audacious uh, thing that we're trying to achieve. And you can see horizontally is time, so it's time bound. We're trying to achieve that goal by a certain 
time frame. And it's measurable, and that's what the vertical axis is. We have the goal metric. Now you can see from the origin, we've been doing these little, represented by these little circles here. I'm sorry, let me pull everybody to the same space. Um, these little circles here represent the steps we're using in order to try to make progress to the goal. And remember, achieving an audacious goal is complex. It's a complex problem. And so we want to use empiricism. And uh, empiricism is the idea of learning from our actual experience. It's actually a philosophy. And in using it in um, an environment like EBM or Scrum, for example, we need to see what's really going on and then make decisions and adaptations based on what's actually happening. And so many of you are familiar with the phrase inspect and adapt. That's what we mean. It's a shorthand way of saying empiricism and a way that we could execute it. So we're going to go step by step trying to make progress to the goal. We'll come back to that in just a moment. And, and sometimes we'll make progress to the goal like we did in the beginning. Sometimes we'll try things out that maybe don't make good progress to the goal, maybe even move us further away from the goal. And we might want to, perhaps we'd even want to back out that change. <clears throat> but uh, in some means or other, we're making progress to wherever we are today. And that's this, this bubble labeled current state. So current state is what we're currently doing. So in the KVA area, that's current value, it's time to market, it's ability to innovate. The goal might be unrealized value potentially, or at least will eventually lead to that. Now, sometimes the distance between where we are in the current state and where we want to be the goal is so great that we should have an intermediate target, something that we think will be a uh, progress toward that goal that would help us give us a win. It will keep us motivated. It will help us make sure that the goal is realizable. And even that it's the right goal. Uh, the goal being because it's audacious, because it's something new in the world is actually a hypothesis. We're not positive that's the right goal. We think it's the right goal. And we might have to make an adjustment to the goal. So the next target is really useful. Let's go back to the moon landing for a minute. That of course was a big audacious goal. Well, we didn't just move from exploding rockets on the launch, launch pad to landing on the moon and returning safely again. No, we had intermediate goals along the way. Uh, we needed to have a rocket stable enough that we could actually launch one human being. And of course, you know that that uh, particular program was the Mercury program. And that, that allowed us to launch a uh, first inanimate objects, then non-humans, um, a monkey, in our case, a chimpanzee, and then finally, uh, human beings. And then uh, we had a next goal. Well, if we can get one person up to just launch off the Earth, can we get them to be in orbit? That's another next target. Maybe we want to get to multiple orbits. Once we do that, that could be another target. And once we've got one person that can do multiple orbits, maybe we get multiple people up there which of course is the Gemini program, et cetera, et cetera. So you see that for some of these audacious goals, we may want to establish next targets, each one of which is extremely audacious, even on itself, but is something that we think is a good next step and will give us confidence that we're actually able to make progress and um, that we, we still use the same mechanism, the EBM framework to get there. Now, <clears throat> so this is an idea or kind of a way to try to diagram how we would use um, a technique uh, of empiricism to make progress toward the goal. But let's tie the measures in. And to do that, uh, to actually use empiricism with evidence-based management, we have to have the evidence. And this diagram is drawn with these little bubbles on purpose. Each one of these circles is actually something we call the experiment loop. And that experiment loop is where the empiricism comes in. So there's a lot of learning going on here. And a lot of you put metrics around a number of experiments. It was really interesting to see that. Here we're talking about experiments, not necessarily, it could be for a product, but it could be for our organization. Um, and the way the experiment loop works is first we create a hypothesis. And this is an idea, one thing that we would like to try that we think would make progress toward the goal. And then we need to perform an experiment. We need to try it out. Um, the hypothesis that we that this would actually be helpful. Let's uh, let's take a different example. Our example of the highest rated user experience, <clears throat> and uh, we may have a hypothesis that we'll get a higher rating uh, in our user experience if we have um, if we reduce the number of clicks that a user has to perform in order to get to their most common tasks. 
that's a hypothesis. And we might refine that to say, let's find one really important task and get it and put it uh, at the top of the menu. Let's make it one click. Let's see if that'll work. Uh, then we try it out. Uh, maybe, hopefully that's a small change. Now maybe depending on your product and your service and how you're architected, maybe that's a lot of work, but we'd like it to be something we could do really quickly, like within a day ideally. And it's an experiment. We don't know if it'll work. So I don't want to give that to all our customers. I might want to just expose it to a very small portion of our population. Maybe in my example, we, we expose, if we had a million active users, I might want to expose that to a hundred. That's a very small percentage, but I could get feedback from that hundred. I could even measure the response, which is really important because if we're going to do an experiment. We have to collect the data. And in this case, it might not be a change in the lagging indicator of user experience, but we may have some leading indicators that we've identified. And we could see if that experiment of putting that commonly used function, one of them anyway, with one click improves that leading indicator. Now, once we've performed the experiment, we collected the data, we have to decide what to do with it, which we've labeled inspect and adapt. <clears throat> um, and based on the results of that experiment and the measures, what should we try next? Is there a new hypothesis we could, we might be thinking about or might guide us? Should we keep that change that we just did or should we modify it? Maybe it was good, but we think it could be better. Or maybe, you know, it didn't work. Uh, experiments, because, it, because it's an experiment, sometimes they fail. And if they fail, we have to decide what we're gonna do about that. That's part of that adaptation as well. Now that's, that loop there is called single loop, loop learning, the way I've described it so far. That is to say, hypothesis, experiment, measure it, do we keep it or not? But EBM is actually based on double loop learning. So in addition to the specific hypothesis and learning about that hypothesis, we use that to also think about the bigger picture, the bigger picture being the goal itself and the next target. Are, are they the right goals or is it a good next target? Do we need to make adjustments or have we learned that maybe the goal is infeasible uh, we thought it was realizable, but maybe it's really not. Um, or maybe it's just the wrong goal and we need to make an adjustment to that goal. Because these are very complex goals, uh, we may learn new information that would cause us to inspect and adapt the goal itself, not just the steps we're taking to achieve it. So that idea of double loop learning is an important aspect uh, to bring in the holistic system thinking about EBM. Uh, one more thing about EBM I want to point out to you, and then uh, we're going to have lots of time for questions, is the idea of how we make progress toward these goals. You might be familiar with the idea of the whirlwind. I know I've been in many organizations that, that live in the whirlwind. In fact, a lot of organizations um, are even proud of it. It's kind of weird. Uh, you see this table at the top here, this, this four quadrant model. You'll notice that on the top row, we have something labeled business as usual. So that would um, that would be the things that we're currently doing, the way that we're operating the business, the way we're making our numbers, the way we're serving customers. Now, some of what we're doing today is high value, as is that I've indicated, operating the business. Yep, we have to do that. Uh, making our numbers, yeah, we've got to do that. Serving our customers, yep, we've got to do that. Uh, some of the things we're doing are low value, like uh, emails, maybe a lot of meetings are not very valuable other people having emergencies and making demands of your time, right? That doesn't necessarily make it valuable, at least for you. Uh, and for most organizations, I don't know about you, but um, that's, you see that's labeled 80%. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. In most organizations, business as usual consumes 120% of the time. Yeah, maybe it's only 110%. Well, if, it, if you're spending 110% of your time just, make, just doing business as usual, how are you supposed to achieve something new? How are you supposed to achieve an audacious goal? Most people call that business as usual row the whirlwind. That's where that, that phrase comes from. That um, is applied in the, the uh, work of the four disciplines of execution, by the way. Now, if you're spending all your time in the whirlwind, obviously there's no time to spend on that audacious goal. So how are we gonna carve out some time to focus on the goal. It's crucial that we do that. And uh, I'd like it to be sort of an 80-20 rule. So I'm not trying to add 20%. I'm not asking you to work 130%. That's ridiculous. That's not sustainable. It wouldn't make any progress anyway. <clears throat> but if we really need to get new products, conquer new markets, achieve superior engagement, or whatever that audacious high value goal is, we're gonna have to find a way to carve out some time. And maybe it's not 20%, maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 5%, but somehow or other, we're gonna have to carve out some time from the whirlwind. And we know that that's a problem. Uh, 
it can be a cultural problem, certainly. I mean, I've worked with organizations where people are proud of how busy they are. It's like a, it's like a badge of honor. But um, again, if we can't figure out a way to free up some time, we're not gonna make progress. So one of the things that EBM uses, uses many things, a player dashboard, I kind of described that briefly, although we didn't have a slide on it. Um, one of the techniques that EBM uses is the cadence of accountability. And this is a regular frequent meeting where the team that's doing the work to make progress toward the logo gets together and they review their progress. They talk about experiments they were able to perform and the results of those experiments. They review the metrics in the dashboard. And they also agree on experiments they're gonna commit to work on before they meet again the next time, next week or whenever it is. It might be more than once a week. And typically we recommend it's at least once a week, uh, but some places do it every two weeks. Um, and <clears throat> this is an important technique to keep us accountable to actually making progress. Uh, it's not uncommon at the first few cadence of accountability sessions that we say, okay, you said you were gonna perform X experiment last time, what happened? Uh, well, I wasn't able to get to it. Okay, well, we're gonna have to figure out what we can do by next time. We need to make a commitment to follow up. And if there's something that I could do to help you or we could work together on it, that's the kind of conversation that we need to have. If there are impediments in the way, how can I remove the impediments? Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that there's a parallel between EBM and Scrum. And um, <clears throat> the, 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 the cadence of accountability shows up in Scrum in a couple of different forms. The daily Scrum is one form of cadence of accountability in the Scrum framework, right? What did we do yesterday? What do we plan to do today? What's in our way? Let's make sure we hold ourselves accountable to make progress toward our goal, which in the case of a sprint, of course, would be the sprint goal. Now, I don't know if it's audacious or not, but there's a parallel there. Uh, likewise, if we're trying to achieve a big important <clears throat> product goal over multiple sprints, there's a parallel there and our cadence of accountability would be the sprint review. What do we accomplish this sprint? What are we gonna work on next sprint? And let's make sure we all agree on the most valuable thing to do toward this important business goal. Now, the reason we don't use Scrum here is because we plan uh, evidence-based management isn't necessarily for Scrum teams. You already have a framework and management needs uh, a framework too that doesn't necessarily get them tied up in Scrum. But you'll notice both Scrum and evidence-based management are based in, on empiricism and they both have certain things. We synchronize regularly. We look at information about our progress. In the case of EBM, it's metrics, both lagging and leading indicators. And um, we, we need to make progress to this complex, through this complex process using this empirical approach of trying things out, abandoning that that doesn't work and adapting to new approaches. Okay, well, that is uh, the summary of evidence-based management for audacious goals. All right, well, let's open it up for questions. It looks like we've got at least 15 minutes for Q&A. <clears throat> Mark, this is Ravi. There was a question from uh, Niranjan. Shouldn't output drive input? Well, uh, the output in the model that we're talking about, let me, let me jump back up to this measure here. So we can take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> In, in this model, and uh, you notice we, I, I'm just using the linear sort of one dimensional thing. Uh, outputs are things that come out of the, comp out of the company itself and they, only, they don't directly affect inputs, but they indirectly affect inputs, right? The thing that affects inputs is the customer, is our interaction with our customers, our ability to sell our products and services, what they, what they say about us in the, um, on social media, for example. Uh, that allows us to have the money to, or the people or the, the time in order to actually take on activities to produce more outputs. So outputs only indirectly um, produce inputs. That's a really important discussion. That's why velocity is such a tricky subject and why most agile coaches or at least certainly experienced agile people understand that velocity Having a goal to increase velocity is really not important. That's not really what we want. We need to make sure we're delivering more value. Well, value to whom? Value to customers and users. And what does value mean? It means that they get benefit out of it. They, they, they get advantage. They like it. They, they want um, to get more of it. They want others to get it too. 
And that's, the outcomes are what's really important. So um, uh, lots of people try to focus on measures of outputs, but the problem is that getting more outputs isn't any good, any, any useful to me if it detracts from our outcomes. So that was my example. Of, let's get more outputs, let's increase our velocity. And in order to do that, I'm gonna do less testing so I can get more stuff out there um, in my example. Presuming that less testing is bad for the user, if that's true, then my outcomes are actually going to go down. So um, outputs only indirectly affect inputs using this model. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, wait, we've got one other question that just came in, uh, Mark, from uh, Neha. She says, is EBM a way to scale? Ah, very good question. Um, <clears throat> well, EBM is scalable, uh, if you will. And what does that mean? Uh, it means that um, you might have a big audacious goal anywhere in the organization. It could be for, at the very top. For example, your CEO or his executive staff, let's say, might have a big audacious goal. They might even have a couple of them. Hopefully they don't have too many because the ability of the organization to achieve them is gonna be limited. Uh, and if they're using EBM, then they're gonna have a dashboard that looks at the lagging indicators of those audacious goals. And they'll also try to identify leading indicators and they would track those regularly. Now, other parts of the organization are gonna to have to take the action. The executive team, at least in most places, doesn't do the work. Maybe in a, maybe in a startup they do. But for any significantly sized company, uh, we're gonna need the different departments or divisions or whatever it might be to actually do work in order to help us achieve that goal. So now uh, we'll take, a, we'll take a, a mythical company. Let's go back to our audacious goal of having the highest rated user experience in our web browser. And our company makes the web browser. Well, I've got a product development department, let's say, I'll call them a department. They're gonna need to have an audacious goal about that user experience. But that's not all. We need marketing to help users be aware of the product. Uh, we probably need sales to do some things in order to uh, get that goal. We may need other groups in the company to do things toward that particular audacious goal. <clears throat> Each one of them that needs to take, not every department may need to take action for it, but whichever ones can contribute to that audacious goal, they need to have their own goal that's relevant to what they can accomplish in a way that contributes. So we need alignment of these audacious goals up and down the company. And that's how EBM scales. Uh, each organization that's using evidence-based managers to achieve that goal would have a goal. They'd have a lagging measure of that goal. The team would develop the leading indicators and a dashboard. They would meet regularly in the cadence of accountability to actually try out different experiments to make progress toward that goal. And that could be down at an individual team level, could be for a whole division, it could be for an entire organization. So that's how EBM scales. Thanks, Mark. We have another question um, from Stephen. What is the biggest challenge in bringing EBM to an organization? Oh, good. Well, I don't know if it's the biggest, but uh, certainly one of them is that this, this whirlwind problem. Uh, <clears throat> for most organizations, they're so busy with meetings about what's going on today that taking time out to, even time out just to think is uh, hard to come by. And um, usually I don't, uh, so, so that's one big problem is we've got to find a, a place in an organization if they want to try this EBM out. By the way, it doesn't have to be at the top. It's almost best if it's not. Um, although it's also best typically if it's not at, the, at an individual team level. Uh, it's, it's good if it's some kind of middle level to try it out. And so one, one of the, the biggest challenges is carving out time from the whirlwind. Right. Again, cadence of accountability is around that, holding our feet to the fire. Uh, another uh, challenge with EBM is don't go too broad too quickly. So let's say that it's a department of, uh, of uh, marketing that starts with this goal. Instead of having every team in marketing also have an EBM goal, let's just have the staff, the department staff have EBM goal. Let's, dev let's let them learn about these audacious goals and the dashboard and the leading indicators and the cadence of accountability, see how that works for them, see what challenges and problems they have in their organizational culture so that they know um, what, what um, challenges and issues they have in, in using EBM to achieve these goals. Once they kind of understand how it works in the organization, now they could look at maybe some parts of 
uh, I'm gonna say lower, some of the teams in marketing in this example, maybe a few of them should start to adopt EBM. Maybe they'll wanna start working upward, managing upward in the organization and see if they could get the higher levels to be thinking about EBM, even just by presenting their dashboard or their, the results of their cadence of accountability to higher levels of, uh, in the organization to let them know how it's working. So, um, so the two key things I run into, whirlwind, and don't try to go too far too fast. Uh, it takes time to learn how to do this effectively. Thank you, Mark. We have another question from Neha, um, kind of a twofold here. What, what, is the C, what if the C-suite is not agile? And then the second question is, have you used this in a fan out model and how does it work there? Yeah, the presumption is the C-suite would not be agile. That's why, for example, um, you, can, you can do what EBM does with Scrum. But trying to tell the C-suite to use Scrum is just not a winning proposition in my experience. Uh, again, maybe some exceptions like a startup company, especially if it's a software company, but my clients aren't like that. <clears throat> and um, so in the EBM, there's a guide for EBM, by the way, that's actually in the process of being updated. You can go to scrum.org and search for EBM guide. A uh, new update will be coming out sometime in the next uh, couple of months. <clears throat> but um, in that guide, it doesn't say agile, it doesn't say scrum, it doesn't even say empiricism uh, because th those are underlying factors that I brought out in this particular context because this is an agile DevOps group. Uh, but with senior managers and executives, I wouldn't even use those words. Uh, now, I usually don't start using EBM at the C-suite, by the way, it usually starts out at a lower level in the organization. And that's partly because of where I enter. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that's, it. that's important to understand. Uh, even though EBM will make an organization more agile, uh, we don't get into the, the agility verbiage and all that stuff because it's typically a turnoff for them. And the, um, in a fan out model, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question there. So maybe they could add more, yeah. maybe some, maybe you know what it means, Jeannie. Entering in the middle. Entering in the middle. Uh, yeah, and so uh, if, if it's if middle out, perhaps, uh, is typically how I do it. And um, it, it is often an organization, for me, they're often already trying to adopt agile practices somewhere, Scrum or Kanban or SAFE or something like that. <clears throat> and um, although SAFE has some other um, factors that uh, may or may not help EBM. So you, there's some challenges there, but uh, typically it's gonna be at a, a middle level in the organization where they say, look, we're trying to do, we're trying to achieve some new important valuable things. We're trying to attack new markets. We're trying to build new products and we're just not making good progress. Um, we've made some progress in this particular area. Maybe it's software development or something, or maybe it's the delivery of service to their customers. How do we get new things? And that's when I'll start to bring EBM so we can start to have those discussions. And, and uh, well, what is it they're trying to do? What is your goal? And that's where the conversation starts. And then we talk, then we talk about bringing in measures and um, uh, very often they understand the lagging measure for the goal, but the idea of leading indicators is very challenging. <clears throat> and uh, that's probably most effective. And then, uh, then again, it may go sideways and then it may go down or may go up and in any order could happen. It depends on the culture of the organization and, and the value that they get out of EBM. Great. And any, any other questions? We do have a comment um, from Venkata and she just says, thanks Mark, good session about EBM. Very good. Well, thank you. Well, thanks everybody for having me. I appreciate you uh, sticking with it and paying attention. And my little experiment with Mural seemed to work okay. So by the way, I will be able to produce a, a PDF of this and I will send that to uh, Jeannie and Ravi so that they can post it for you all to get after the fact. And of course it'll have all your little sticky notes on there and stuff like that. That's great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks everyone for being on tonight.